Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode of SGTV. We have Alex Robinson from Colleg Cambria coming back on the show and Neil McManus from Leicester College. So it's good to have you both back. Um, so today I want to ask you about what's changed in the industry. So I think to, to get this episode into perspective, I'd like, to, I'd like both of you to tell me your route in, into the industry, sort of how, where you started, you know, did you start on the tools and how you got to where you are now? Okay. Uh, originally, uh, from leaving school, I went into a mechanical uh, engineering background. And then for, from there through to a drop in the industry, redundancies and everything else, uh, I actually went into the uh, footwear uh, business. It was only after a few years that I realised that you know, I needed to get get a trade behind me. Uh, that I went back into electrical, working with a, a couple of local companies at the time, uh, traveling the country, working in Jersey, but mainly in the UK. Uh, undertook me electrical qualifications, and and from uh, achieving me electrical qualifications, it was there a few years later that I went back to uh, undertake a testing inspection qualification. Uh, and uh, I thought, you know what, this teaching role, this is for me. Uh, and so therefore, uh, I got into the uh, teaching, uh, which is about 21 years ago. You don't, you don't look that old, Neil, really. <laughs> So how, how about you, Alex? We had a family friend who was an uh, electrician and uh, we were having a lot of work done uh, at my family home at the time. So he was working there. So I was sort of giving him a helping hand around our house. And then he offered that I could come and give my hand on the weekends with jobs here and there. This is while I was still at school. Um, and, you know, I used to really enjoy it. So I decided, you know, this is what I want to do when I leave school. Um, at the time, um, I wasn't able to get an apprenticeship when I left school, so I started on the uh, full-time programme at the FE College, Bersham Road, uh, College Cambria, where I actually teach now. Uh, so I was actually a student, and many of my colleagues were actually my tutors at the time as well. So, um, so uh, after doing sort of six, eight months uh, on the full-time program, I managed to uh, get an apprenticeship with a local contractor and they were mainly doing sort of schools, hospitals, reactive maintenance, uh, uh, an aerospace company and install work. So they did a bit of everything, domestic, commercial and industrial. So it was nice because um, I got a real varied range of work with that apprenticeship. Um, then I went to work for a, a large company that focused on uh, new, uh, new large-scale developments. Um, and then an opportunity came up, and I've been uh, a lecturer at the college for seven years now. So, yeah, that's me. So do you see that there's been many changes in the industry from when you started? Um, and I want to know good and bad. So things that have actually improved the industry or things you think may have maybe taking a step back. Yeah, there's been uh, an awful lot of changes, hasn't there? Where do you start? Um, if we talk about technology first and the changes with that, um, you know, it was, I think, 1926, Alex, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Tesla spoke about being able to speak uh, a long distance to another country uh, using a, a radio frequency, um, and and now this is what he spoke about was a, a mobile phone, and then and then you look at the size of the first mobile phone and what it could do, to what it can do now. There's been a massive change in uh, technology and also uh, the environment and and using renewable energy. You know. Solar, we, we've seen a big growth in solar on people's houses, um, electrical, who, who would have ever believed that we'd have electrical cars driving around on motorways? And, you know, the government planned to stop gas installation, gas boilers. They planned to take off the road diesel cars uh, and replace them all with electrical cars in the future. So 
the, the, the amount of changes that come. Look at Skullmore Group. Where did you start selling plug tops? To where are you now? And, and all the different ranges. And I always use Skullmore Group as a good example. Lighting from a light GLS light bulb to LEDs now. And the way you can control LEDs and change all the color in the mooding and, and different color ranges with them. You know, you've got eating controls that are used now and, and you can be away from your home and yet you can turn your eater on, your cooker, you can record Sky TV uh, to watch Manchester United win the league one year again. Um, it's all these things that, are, that have changed. So technology's changed, but also there's been big changes in the industry, which I don't know um, the government or the certification schemes have got right. And one of the um, biggest uh, changes came about a few years ago with the introduction of Part P, the domestic installer scheme. And although it's got good practices that, you know, it, it's insisting that people that put new installations in kitchens, in bathrooms, in, in extra dangerous areas or garages or outside, uh, have to report it and certificate it. But to me, this led to a downfall whereby uh, a skilled electrician is being... Uh, downgraded uh, and I'm not sure whether you can say I'm a fully qualified electrician after a 12 14 week course so I think there needs to bring about uh, similar to what the gas in industry do where an electrician and electrical work should be carried out by a competent person and bring about a competent person scheme uh, rather than the certification scheme for bathroom fitters and kitchen installers uh, that in my opinion and I'm sure a lot of people out there uh, opinion is not being uh, run correctly. So you mean almost like a similar to the plumbers how they have the gas safety register or whatever it's called you know you, because there's two, there's two levels, I think, from what I believe on, on plumbers. You, you know, like the guys who can go in, change taps, fit bathrooms, but then to actually work on gas and boilers, you need to be gas-safe gas, gas safe registered. That's so, right. And I think there needs to be an electrical safe uh, port brought back in. There used to be a structure where you had uh, JIB that was there for employees that was there for apprentices that spoke about wages and health and safety and welfare of an employee on site. You then had ECA that were Electrical Contractors Association that were there to support the employer, the company. And then NIC, NAPI, uh, Alexa, these certification schemes have, have changed. They're there really primarily originally to support the customer. They were there as a customer guarantee that they'd, they'd, they'd guarantee the safety. If, the, if, if you were registered under one of their certification schemes, they would be there to, if something went wrong, to provide another uh, certified person uh, to put the work right. And I think over time uh, that they're now becoming a business that are looking at every opportunity, you know, to earn more money. And by providing certification schemes and allowing unskilled persons to install, you know, ring mains in lighting circuits in bathrooms, uh, and then to be testing, inspecting it, and, and certificating it. And, and I honestly think that, you know, for the majority of these people, a 12-week course isn't long enough where an apprentice has done four years and it should be recognised that they're the people that need to, you know, you can have a bathroom installer pull cables in under the supervision of a skilled person, 
And I think, in my opinion, that the introduction of Port P uh, is a shambles. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. And like we've sort of alluded to, there is no domestic installer qualification. It, you know, there's a competent electrician and someone who's not competent. And if they were to introduce a system similar to the plumbing where you can practice at level two and you're able to do a certain level of work and then you go on to, you know, be a gas engineer and then you're competent to do the full range of work. And that's fair enough, but I think until that system in place, then maybe you know it's not it's not appropriate to have that sort of distinction um, between a domestic installer and uh, you know a competent. And and I think one of the other things, that, you know, great, really positive for the industry is how uh, the electrical industry uh, engineers, IET have embraced uh, renewable energy. And, you know, you look out your window every day and there's always the sun that comes up and how we harvest that into solar. And I, and I would like to see the government actually drive uh, solar and provide it at a, a more cost-efficient way that people could purchase it uh, to run uh, from their property. The roof space is a wasted space. And if if solar panels are installed on there, uh, it's going to provide opportunities to not only feed back electrical into the grid that could be shared amongst the poorer families. You know, if every roof was producing electricity and it was fed into the grid, it can help the elderly people, the vulnerable people, uh, with free electricity. Another thing that, that, you know, that's really exciting is this introduction of EV cars. And I think there's going to be, there's a lack of infrastructure at the moment. Uh, you only need to walk around uh, your local streets and you can see, I would say, out of every 50 houses, maybe even more, there'll be one, one house that has an EV charging point. And if we drive down the motorway to so how many, how many, um, EV charging points are there. So then there, there needs to be a, 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 a revisit and a look. Uh, it's not about making uh, money all the time, uh, harvesting the sun, that's free. And I, I appreciate the cost of solar panels. I honestly think a lot of people made a lot of money where the government could come in and set up a, an energy renewable uh, task force that could be installing solar panels but then the the electricity is fed back into the grid to support you know vulnerable people and, and the elderly yeah i think the changes i can see the changes highlighted i remember probably about 15 years ago i was working on the development of premium houses in um Presbury, so it's like Wimslow, Alderley Edge, so, where all your favourite footballers will live, Neil, that sort of way. And I mean, the house is beautiful, you know, top spec, premium on everything, no expense spared. But when it came to the electrical installation, it was pretty bog standard. It was, it was you know, rings, radios, lighting, maybe a few more spotlights, a uh, bit of up lighting here and there, but nothing really that you'd consider now to be spectacular no smart homes i think the most exciting thing was a, a video doorbell at the time but if you fast forward to now if you imagine doing you know working on a property in that area it would be completely automated you know that literally the front doors would lock themselves from the phone it would be it would just be a central hub that literally controlled every system in that property. Um, so I think that just sort of demonstrates how the rise in home automation, smart technology has come on. Because, I mean, if anywhere was going to have it at the time, it would have been that property. Um, and now I imagine the electrical installation would be a completely different ball game on a, a modern install at that level. Um, so there's just more to consider now for a modern designer. Not only have they got to consider automation, you know, like Neil's already mentioned, the drive for energy efficiency, 
on micro generation technologies. It's not just the case now of how many sockets do you want in that room or do you want down lights in here, which, you know, there's, there's a lot more considerations. Um, so, it, you know, there is that need to sort of upscale and continuously develop that maybe necessarily wasn't there. Do you think, do you think it's been difficult to, to keep up with that? Because obviously I think it's been driven, you're seeing all this new smart tech and things like that that's been driven from manufacturers and it's obviously been um, required by customers that they're, they're driving the market up that want this tech in their homes. But do you think that's maybe caused a little bit of a shortfall for electricians that maybe be sort of hung in the balance of not necessarily having the education given to them to keep up with that type of demand? I think that's a good point that there's an awful lot of, um, like I say, the, an apprentice comes to a college and he undertakes the qualification that's set for them. Uh, and, and basically it's about installing cables in houses, factories, um, commercial buildings, using uh, containment systems that, uh, that are around, uh, tray trunking. Um, and it doesn't always focus on the changes in industry, uh, such as, you know, you, you walk down um, a street now and uh, I, as sad as it is, I used to uh, stop and look at pylons and the uh, transformers on pylons. In I that. still do I that. Remember, I, I remember so. being in Scotland, in New Zealand, and I'd stop the car and I'd fill it film and hydro dam in, in that. And now I'm more interested as when I'm walking down the street, if someone's got ESP cameras up because I know a bit about them and we, we give the students an insight to them. But what we, what we don't do is, is really specialise in, in them because we don't have the uh, resources, the time to do, do that. We need to stick to the actual components of the, the qualification. So there's a big uh, need, I think, for all electricians to undertake a CPD, uh, and whether that's visiting the ESP centre or, um, you know, look at, look at LEDs. There's still, there's still a massive thing. The more It makes me smile now as students put on Facebook, uh, this is a new install in a new house and, and you look up and there's like 30 uh, down lighters and you think, I wonder how you've installed them. Have you all installed them off one, one circuit, one driver, you know, and I think the, the skill set that's needed for that, uh, some training uh, there. And, mm -hmm. and it, currently, because there's nothing in the industry, it would want or require uh, someone like the Skullmore Group to provide these training events uh, for uh, electricians and installers. Yeah, I think it's that's why it's it's great when you know people like Skullmore. You know, I know we've had kit donated to our college. You know, the smart lighting kit, etc., so that we can expose the apprentices and the full-time learners to this technology. <laughs> And that's what makes them an asset as well to the employers because the employers, they may not have the time or the where for all to sort of get involved with the new technology and the new kit. But if they've got apprentices that are coming through and they're getting exposed to it in FE institutions and they're getting up-to-date training, then that makes them the asset and then they can pass on this knowledge and information that you know, that makes them an attractive prospect as well. And that's maybe what sometimes employers don't consider about um, apprentices is that they may have skill sets of the future that they don't have. You know, they're a younger generation. They're used to working with apps. They're used to working with smartphones. They may be more savvy with technology than some of the, you know, the older Sparks or the Sparks that haven't grown up with this technology. So, okay, they may need the um, 
the upskilling as far as hand skills and electrical is concerned, but they definitely bring something to the table uh, when it comes to smart tech, I think, a lot of them. And if they can be exposed to it and um, get hands-on with it in their FE college as well, then that, that, that's only going to help further. I think also, um, I mean, I've been privileged because I work with Skullmore Group uh, quite often uh, that we get exposed to uh, systems uh, and new technology that you have I can remember being on site and you get um, the spec in that it's all been designed at an eye level and as an installer you've got this equipment you think I've never seen this before how do I install all this and it, it, it may be useful that in the future that similar to this technology we're using now that if a, if, a, if a specification such as the, a, a Skullmore range has been selected to be installed uh, on a big site there uh, before, you know, there's an hour, there's a, a, a video clip uh, where you can talk technical advice and guidance and just run a video on how to install it. Uh, that would be a real big help for apprentices. Um, I had a note from you guys saying that there's um, a loss of fire alarm apprenticeships. Now that's something I've I've never really heard of. So so what is it exactly that that's happened there? Again, um, I think it's more qualification based. That uh, quite often uh, at Les College we get approached by uh, companies that would like specialist fire alarm installers. So they've got an electrician, but actually they, they require a fire alarm apprentice. Uh, and again, it's a special skill set. Uh, I, I wouldn't, you know, I could in, install a, a basic uh, fire alarm system in a domestic building. If I was asked to install fire alarm system in a, a commercial building, such as the college, uh, I, I'd have no idea. I'd need up training and up skilling. And, and therefore, I think because companies, uh, local companies, small one man man, are looking for every opportunity to grow the business, uh, they'd like the college to kind of like give, a, give someone the underpinning knowledge uh, so then the student uh, can gain an apprenticeship but also develop their skills on site. So I think it's that basic knowledge and a, an apprenticeship qualification. Uh, now, with the introduction of T-levels, uh, which are the new study programme, uh, there are uh, specialist routes where you can choose to be an electrical engineer, electronics, or, or you can uh, choose to go down the security route. But that's not been introduced into apprenticeships yet. And, and I think there ought to be uh, specialist add-on units that are available to an apprentice. So if you like, uh, similar to the gas safe debt, I'm an electrician, but I'm also a, a, a security engineer. So it's, it's adding uh, gas safety, you can be uh, a gas uh, fire, but then if you want to do cooking ranges, you've got to have that qualification. A different CN number. So I really think specialist units need adding to qualifications for uh, apprentices and to meet the skill shortages. How do you think that would be practically implemented? Would um, you see a lot in in other industries where you get like grandfather rights, where if you're a certain age, you can sort of carry on doing what you're doing, but any people coming in to the industry from a younger age have to undergo these types of qualifications. Do you think that would be the same sort of way you'd apply it? So again, it's, it's do you separate it that a security engineer deals with CCTV cameras, fire alarms, door entry systems, okay? So their route is purely focused on that and you've got an electrician that does an electrician route. That could be one way. Uh, I'd like to see it as further development. Currently, apprenticeships are over three years, 42 months. I'd like to see it extended to a further six months where a, an apprentice has to choose a specific route, an additional unit, 
which could be fire alarms in security. Because there's also the maintenance units, isn't there, that are available? Yeah, yeah which I would class in as an, uh, an engineer, but they could pick up, you know, something specialising in controls, you know, eating controls. So we've talked talked about the uh, many changes in the industry from the candlelit era of Neil's upbringing to, to the more modern stuff like the, the solar panels and EV charging. And, and that's, it's, it's always changing very quickly. And as, as we spoke about, it can be quite difficult to keep up with. Um, so how, where do you see the industry going even further? you know, past the EV charging and solar panels, or do you think that is going to be the main thing going forward? I think we're going to have this sort of ecosystem within our homes <clears throat> where we've got, you know, we've got the car sitting on the drive with the battery. We've got the solar panels on the roof. And, you know, in off-peak times, we'll have our car feeding into the grid or while we're, you know, we're, we're, we're plugged in our charging station while they're sitting dormant, they'll be feeding in. So I think there'll be this more, can I think of ecosystem as the best way to describe it, where it's sort of, it's not just all take, take, take from the, um, from the grid system. It, there'll be a lot more, you know, two way um, and dual metering where we're feeding in and out through multiple sources. Um, so I think I can see it sort of as the rise of um, EV charging and solar panels and et cetera. There's going to be, um, we're going to be going in that sort of direction. I, I can see uh, looking at, you know, smart homes where they've been uh, a luxury in the past to becoming more of readily available in, in uh, uh, more cost cost available for every household if technology changes. Um, will we still be installing cables? Uh, you start looking at the uh, Skullmore Smart Home range, uh, and you know the installation of switches in that, and and it's the key fob or it's your phone now, and it's it's touchscreen uh, technology. Uh, you look at Alexa, don't we? And, and um, you know, Alexa, turn me lights on. Alexa, shut the curtain. You know, it's 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 amazing, scary, and fascinating that that could happen in the future. Um, I, I honestly, uh, I'm, my, my concerns is that everybody becomes a couch potato because everything becomes voice activated and touched in and that uh, or will it create a uh, a better environment for for more social time and in, in, in family i think it's finding the right balance isn't it yeah it's how it's running it's it's how it's delivered in in the future uh, but trying to keep up with it all it, it, it's impossible and trying to be a lecturer that tries to cover all these subjects. And again, if it was specialised, we could have uh, specialist uh, lecturers in. Uh, and will that create job opportunities across the country? Possible. Yeah. You know, I do plan this year to get out there and uh, improve my smart home technology. So look, look forward to coming over to Tamworth uh, to do some training with you guys. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely a watch this space type of scenario, isn't it? Where no one really knows what exactly is going to happen, but you've just got to embrace it and go with it and try and get on board with it, I suppose. Yeah, I think there's always going to, there's always going to be a need for the, for, you know, the skills that we're utilising now, because at the end of the day, there's only so many applications you can use wireless for. I mean, we're going to struggle to be uh, transmitting the same... Uh, current wirelessly as we do with a 240 mil phone call <laughs> but um so there is always going to be the need for the skills but whether there'll be less cabling and domestic and um but again there's always going to be whatever there's always going to be a central hub that controls the system which is always going to need a supply so um 
there may be a reduction, but we'll just we'll just have to adapt and develop the yeah. the, the other skill sets. And will will it up to me? Will it will it be uh, will will it be K, you know the cables as we know today, or will it be you know similar to uh, a plug in play system where you know they're on thin strips that are capable of carrying the same amount of current? Yeah, yeah. or cat six instead for signalling rather than voltage yeah, current. Yeah, it's just, yeah. yeah. It's it's going to be different for sure, but I think it, there's definitely still going to be there's still going to be the need for the electrician for the yeah. The, it, without a doubt, yeah. it's it's uh, certainly the trade that to me has got the most uh, creativity and uh, future proofed attached to it. So as an electrician, I can always see there being an electrician because the sun, the wind, the wave. It's all there. It's all. It's not costing us anything, uh, and it's going to produce energy uh, that's clean energy, uh, which is a massive drive for the computer. Will there be changes in buildings, in brickwork? Well, to me, you know, perhaps the future is uh, that a lot of houses are made off-site, and and they're, they're a pod format. So, what will that do to the to the uh, brick in construction trade? Mm. But they'll always to... want wiring up, won't they? And, mm. and I suppose there'll be a need to uh, look at wastewater and things like that. Yeah. Heating, when they ultimately do decide to cut the gas off, will heating go electric? And well, you know, will I that think... come into our remit? I think yeah, that's, there needs to be a that's big... That's a big question, I think, yeah. Big drive on electrical heating. I know now if I was building a new house, I'd put electric heaters in. Uh, they're more efficient than they ever were. Um, they're cleaner. Uh, you've not got to worry about gas. You know, you cook electrical, you eat electrical, and stick solar panels on your property. And, you know, the same yeah. thing that's involved. I think ideally, from a customer perspective and from a, an installer perspective, you want that happy balance where, as a customer, you, you can get your install for a cost-effective way and you're not paying an energy provider every month. But at the same time, from an installer point of view, you, you've not been put out of a job by this new tech. You, you know, you, you're keeping up with it and you've got the opportunity to keep working and installing it. So guys, again, thank you for coming on the show. I hope people out there found this useful. And um, if you follow us here at SGTV, you can see more from me, Alex and Neil. Um, it'd be nice to see Neil fit in and maybe shave his head and grow some stubble or something, just so so we all match. <clears throat> I've had a shave this morning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is not COVID style, by the way. <laughs> Everyone else has copied me. I've suddenly become very fashionable. Yeah. Okay. Right then. Thanks again, guys, and we'll see you next time.